doing here. So I don't see any timbers in the background. I don't see a crusty ass hoodie or t-shirt. I'm looking almost official today, but today I'm taking you along on the job for a project. Now I don't normally run the camera on the job because it's just, uh, I don't know, it's one of those things I don't want a customer sitting there looking at me like I have three heads, but this is one of those places where I can do that and my employer actually would like some more of this done. So these videos I'll make, I'll make them special for my channel, but then I'm going to save clips and things like that for my company. So it's kind of a win-win situation, but anyway, what we are looking at today, this is called a power flame burner. It is on a small wheel McLean model 80 boiler. Um, this, this boiler is pretty small. It's about five and a half gallon an hour oil burner. I'll walk you through what a couple of the things are. But what we have going on today is the burner motor on this thing failed and she still tried to light. So they were getting a puff of smoke, all that good stuff. So stay tuned. I hope you enjoy it. And I'm going to walk you guys through some of this stuff. All right, so here's what we have going on. So here's our burner motor right here. It attaches to a squirrel cage that sits in there. So we have to get this stuff, just this UV sensor has to come off right here. We have to unbolt this. This whole assembly slides out. We put the new motor and squirrel cage on. Should be simple. It's usually pretty easy. And, uh, all right, first things first, we need to unwire this thing, but we do have to check the power. And also keep in mind when you unwire something like this, I don't know how many of you get into this kind of work, but uh, this is a dual voltage single phase motor, so it's either 115 volt or 230 volt. Nothing too bad, but we just have to be aware of what wires go where. So when we put the new one on, so when we put the new one on, everything works. No power. Of course, we shouldn't have anything on a neutral line, but I check them all in case you're back feeding through a winding. Yeah, so the first thing that gets unbolted is this UV sensor. Now this UV sensor does the same thing that the little CAD cell in your regular oil burners do. All it does is it senses the UV rays off of the flame and tells you you have flame. But these just go on hand tight. Now just have a little rubber bushing in there and then you have your uh, the eye itself. So set that aside because we don't want to break that. Drop our tools. pop it right out. And you guys remember how I showed you this puller when we were doing the bandsaw? This is the situations where this thing shines. So I want to get it over the hub, which is right there in the middle. And then what I do is I'll adjust this shaft until until it lines up with the bottom of the squirrel cage. Now you have a couple set screws on here. You want to make sure that if you're using one of these, you don't allow those set screws to bottom out on the actual set screws of what you're working on. The fun part is getting your fingers in there to tighten everything. If 
Funny you guys always wonder why I'm always working on my hands and knees doing stuff. Well, my job the every day at work, that's usually how we end up having to work on stuff. It's not much creature comforts in this field, I'll tell you that. Middle of winter, you're usually up on a roof because some some reason people think putting their heat and air conditioning systems on roof is an, roofs is an awesome idea. And up here in a cold climate, it stinks. So it kind of goes without saying once you put this on, you put the wheel back on, you can't bury it too far in here, otherwise you'll be scrubbing on the heads of these bolts. Also the other thing you want to check, look for dust, stuff like that. If the squirrel cage is dusty and dirty, it needs to be clean. Keep in mind you have little pieces for balance on here. You do not want to move those because that will throw the balance of the wheel off. That's why they put them on there. It's kind of like uh, wheel weights on your vehicle. Now I know most of you are probably never going to work on a burner like this, but if you're a new HVAC guy and you come across this video, just some little pointers in there for you. The thing you want to make sure that keyway is engaged well. That's what it's going to keep this from spinning off on you. Just give it a spin. We've got about an eighth inch clearance around all those bolt heads. You can go a little. And give that a spin too to see if that wheel's out of balance, if it's wobbling all over the place. But sometimes that might be an indication of why the motor failed in the first place. And we just go through and tighten the set screw back up. Again, you really need to make sure the set screw is bottoming out on the key. Because if it's not, the key could slide out of there and create you all kinds of problems. It'll ruin the shaft on the motor when that set screw starts eating into it. Alright, so this is, I told you I'd explain to you guys the concept of a dual phase or a uh, dual voltage motor. Now this is a simple third horse single phase motor and that'll be written right there pH phase one. And this is important your RPM so when you're ordering replacement motors RPMs, phase, and the voltage. So this can either be 113 volts or 200 or excuse me 115 volts or 230 volt. Now keep in mind with your voltages you're allowed a 10% swing there and the motor will operate safely. So say you have a 240 volt circuit and it's running 220 volts, you're fine. You have to watch it one way or the other though. One of the most important things when you're ordering a replacement motor for anything, and I know it's really hard to see this here, this right there, FR, that stands for frame. And the frame on this is a 56C. So if you guys have electric motors on your shop tools that you're trying to replace and say you can't find an OEM one or the OEM one is outrageously expensive, you can go to Granger's or a lot of other places, Amazon. If you have the data, so you have your horsepower, your voltage, your RPMs, your amperage, that can be important also. And of course your duty rating, this one's a continuous duty rating, that means it can run all the time. Of course your Hertz, which is pretty standard here in the US, 60 Hertz US, I believe 50 Hertz Europe. Phase, single phase or three phase. 
And that guy right there, frame 56C, what that 56C stands for, that tells you how that motor mounts. So if you have a motor that's a different brand and it has a frame of 56C, this motor will fit on that same one as long as that frame number matches. And also, you can change the rotation on a motor like this and they give you the diagrams right there. As far as your dual voltage goes, you have your low voltage table. It's going to tell you what color wire goes to what terminal inside the motor. Same thing for your high voltage. And that is going to be... Now, let's see... You can hold it steady. That would be the terminals inside here. So, that's the important stuff when you're replacing motors that you really want to look for. Alright, so as promised, I'll show you a few features inside this burner and we'll get something to point with. Right here, look at that. Okay, so this is a power flame burner, and you find these a lot on commercial and industrial boilers, burners, things like that. Sometimes you find them on makeup air units, which bring in air from the outside and then they temper the air. So control switch on and off, indicator lights, and this is a full modulation boiler. So this switch here I can manually modulate it with this little potentiometer or I can put it in auto and it works on its own. And there is a switch right, right up there, the, the little dial next to the one with the red button on it, that's our modulation control. So what that does is when the, so it'll modulate the burner up and down based on the demand of how warm the boiler is. So the hotter the boiler gets, the lower it, it, it lowers down that modulation. So it brings in less air and less fuel. A little bit of a cooler fire, you're not burning so much fuel. So we just have some control relays. This brings things on and off. We got a relay here for fresh air damper because that is very important for our combustion process. If you do not have the right fuel air mixture, this thing will soot up and it will not run very well. Something a little different that you probably won't see on a residential burner is, that is our oil pump right there. So it's a little bit of a higher volume oil pump put on its own motor. And this is designed to run as most oil pumps are, 300 PSI in high fire. And how we control all of that, I know we're moving the camera around a lot. So we have this, let's see if we can get a good shot. We have this handy nifty little guy right here. That's called a help valve. And that actually is a, works off the bypass of your two pipe oil system. So as you demand more fuel going to the drawer assembly, to the nozzle, this bypass valve closes off and sends more fuel into the nozzle. It opens up more to send less fuel to the nozzle when you're looking for low fire. And over here, we have an actuator motor that runs the whole show. So you have your air dampers. So you got a lower one and a higher one. They're on the same actuator arm. That goes to that actuator motor on that cam. And then on the other side, see right 
down in here that actually drives the well, get the wires out of the way that drives the Hauk valve so in a nutshell that's how these things work of course you have your oil solenoid valves things like that you have your various safeties you have a low water cutoff you have a high temperature reset now you say that says 230 and you're saying well that's at boiling temperature keep in mind the higher the pressure on the system the the higher that boiler or that uh, boiling temperature is. Now 230 is a little bit high. I'd prefer right around 212, but that's how they engineered this and spec'd it out. So anyway, let's switch the camera around. I'm going to turn it on. We're going to see if we can get this to fire up the first time after the repairs. All right, before we turn this back on, we're going to turn get our pumps back going. Two pumps running. This is why we uh, pat them off with the camera. Now let's see the magic of this, if this is going to work the first time. Control switch will turn on, we're going to get a low water light, and then it's going to get really loud in here when this thing decides to fire. It takes it a second to, oh, we got a demand. Well, there you have it folks, another boiler running, another repair done. So once in a while I like to bring you guys along when I can. I might even do a little bit more of this next week because it looks like I am on boiler replacements all week. So we're going to be changing out a couple boilers that are probably two or three times the size of this one. Uh, maybe even bigger than that. But uh, anyway, so I'll be showing you guys what our process is for that. So anyway, hope you guys enjoyed it. Like and subscribe if you feel like it. If not, well, what are you going to do? So. Take it easy and I'll see you on the next one.